Hello everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on modern uses of group sequential designs in sample size re-estimation. This is the second webinar in our new introductory webinar series on complex innovative trial designs. We encourage everyone to stay around to the end of the webinar where we will review the schedule of upcoming webinars in this series. I am pleased to introduce our presenter today. Chris Jennison is professor of statistics at the University of Bath, UK. His PhD research at Cornell University concerned the sequential analysis of clinical trials, and he has continued to work in this area for over 35 years. His book with Professor Bruce Turnbull, Group Sequential Methods with Applications to Clinical Trials, is a standard text on this topic and is widely used by practicing statisticians. More recently, he has written with a variety of co-authors on adaptive trial design and overarching optimization of the drug development process. Professor Jennison's research is informed by experience of clinical trial analysis at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Boston and a broad range of consultancy with pharmaceutical companies. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Chris. Thank you, Alyssa. So I'm very happy to be talking today on the topic of group sequential designs and sample size re-estimation. So I'm going to go through these two topics, uh, explain the challenges that they address, um, I'll summarize very briefly the, the sort of theory that supports the methods, and then we'll look at some examples. We'll have a use of the EAST software to demonstrate uh, the design and the analysis in these examples, and then we'll discuss the methods, and we'll end with the question at the end of the session. So first of all, let's talk about group sequential designs. I'm going to focus on their use in phase three trials, and uh, as I'm sure the listeners are all aware. Phase three trials are a crucial step in the process of drug development and drug approval. They're usually large and they're usually expensive. The challenge in the group sequential design is to reduce the length of these phase three trials, thereby saving resources, the cost of actually conducting the trial, and also reaching a conclusion sooner. The drug being tested will no doubt have a limited patent lifetime, so reaching a conclusion sooner would allow the sponsor a longer period in which to have the patent uh, when that drug goes to market. And in the schematic here, we see a thick sample study with its length, which is longer than that of the group sequential trial, which, which has stopped at the interim analysis. So the group sequential trial could have carried on a bit longer um, if the data had not been doing just the right thing, but typically it will stop earlier. So in this schematic, we see another picture of the same idea. The, um, the group sequential trial is set up. There is a, a maximum sample size that one might continue to at the end. Uh, the hope is that one will stop at one of the and interim analyses, either because the results are very positive and we can stop early and show the treatment is effective, the new treatment is, is superior to the control, but also if results are really rather poor, then we can stop for futility. And it's, if the trial is going to be negative, it's still better to stop early than carry on all the way to the end and then get a negative result. And what we're going to see is that group sequential designs with just two or three analyses, a small increase in maximum sample size over the fixed sample test, can reduce the average sample size by around 30%. So that's a, a major saving in, in uh, resource and in time. So here's the summary of the sort of things that a group sequential design can offer. Imagine a phase three trial that's set up with a, a one-sided type one error probability of two and a half percent, which is standard. Um, I'm going to talk about the treatment effect I call theta, and so that will be a measure of the difference between the performance of the new treatment and the control. And suppose in, in this case, a value of theta equals one is a clinically significant treatment effect, and so we want power 0.9 in that case. Um, imagine that the response variance and other considerations are such that a fixed sample size design would require 100 patients per treatment. So what might happen in a group sequential design with three analyses? Well, we'll have a slightly higher maximum sample size, say 105 patients per treatment, but we'll typically stop before that and in the, in, the, in the plot, you can see the horizontal line here is the 
sample size of 100 with the fixed sample design. And then the red curve is the average sample size, which does depend on the true treatment effect theta. So in the case of theta equals 1, which is where we set our power of 0.9, we've got an expected sample size of 77. If, in fact, the treatment and control are equally good and theta is zero, then we also stop early a lot of the time and have an expected sample size of just 66. And if we're in the middle, which is when it's most difficult to distinguish these two cases, um, we have an expected sample size of 87. So it's still well below the fixed sample size. So there are definitely potential benefits to using group sequential tests. So moving on, let's talk about how group sequential designs work. I'm just going to say a little bit about the theory behind the methods. First of all, what does the group sequential test look like? Well, we can represent it as a pair of stopping boundaries. So here we're at each analysis, we're calculating the Z statistic, and this will be the usual statistic for running a test of our null hypothesis, given the data that we have so far. And we compare that with, with a boundary. So we have an upper boundary here. If the Z statistic is sufficiently high and we cross the upper boundary, we can stop and reject the null hypothesis. And then for the lower boundary, if we're below that, then the idea is we should stop and not reject the null hypothesis. And basically, um, early on, we're abandoning the trial for futility. So Z here is the, I think it's the usual Z statistic is a measure of the amount of evidence against the null hypothesis. Now, of course, if we look at our data repeatedly and keep testing our null hypothesis, if we, if we always did that at the same alpha equals 0.025 level, we'd be inflating the type 1 error probability. So we have to set this boundary in such a way that the overall probability of crossing the other boundary and therefore rejecting H0 is 0.025. And also, we want, we want to have power 0.9 when the treatment effect is our specified value, say, plus delta. And so the overall sample size and the boundary together are chosen in a way that gives that power 0.9. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we have some theory. We know the behavior of the sequence of Z statistics as they evolve over time. It's easy to derive that if you have simple normal responses. What's really nice is that it turns out that in lots of other situations, we get the same joint distribution of that sequence of Z statistics. And those situations include survival data. If you're doing a sequential form of the log rank test or looking at parameter estimates in a, for a treatment effect in a Cox model. So we can use the same construction in all these different settings. And given that information about the, the distribution of disease, we can calculate probabilities of type 1 error and power. And basically, that involves integrating over Z1, Z2, Z3, et cetera. And we do that by numerical integration, and the methods are fast and accurate. And moreover, there's software that will actually do all that work for you. So it's good to know that this theory and, and, and computation method is in place, but actually, that's all you really need to know once you have the software that implements these methods. One thing to point out, though, which is a key part of modern group sequential testing, is the idea of an error spending design. And the reason for this is, although we might set up our study and say we'll have a certain number of observations arriving for each interim analysis, in practice, the numbers that actually occur are going to be more variable. Analyses are typically set at calendar times. They've got to go into the diaries of the data monitoring committee well in advance. And so what you actually get is somewhat random. In particular, if you have survival data where the information is really based on the number of observed events, then that is very much um, a random variable. Now, information here I'm using in the statistical sense. So information is defined as, as shown over here on the right. At analysis k, we have our estimate theta hat k of the treatment effect. And the information is 1 over the variance of theta hat k. So as the study continues, at later analysis, the variance of our estimate 
gets smaller because we've got more data, and so the information increases. And it's that information that we calculate and feed into the error spending rule, and that tells us how much type 1 error, how much type 2 error have been allocated so far, and that will determine the boundary for the group sequential test. So let's look at this in the context of an example. So my example is a, a trial that's testing cholesterol-lowering drug, and the aim is to compare the new experimental treatment against a placebo control. Our endpoint is a reduction in cholesterol measured in the units of milligrams per deciliter um, over a four-week period. I think um, in different places, different units are used for cholesterol, so uh, the numbers I will give are on, on this scale. Um, we're assuming that when we measure this reduction, then for each subject there's a, a normal distribution with a standard deviation of 25. I'm going to make the very simplifying assumption that we know that value of the standard deviation and don't have to estimate it from our, our data. You, in practice, you would estimate the variance, um, use a t-test, but here we're going to assume that we know sigma. And theta then, the treatment effect will be the difference in mean responses, where responses this reduction over four weeks, the difference between experimental treatment and control, and measured in such a way that a positive value of theta means that our new treatment is superior to control. So how do you set up a group sequential design? And what I'd like to argue is it's actually very simple because you have to do all the things that you would do in setting up a fixed sample design, and then you've got one extra step, which I'm going to explain. So first of all, you have to ask, what is my type 1 error rate? What power do I want? Um, all the other aspects of the trial as well. How do we group patients and, and allocate them to treatments? Suppose in this example, we've got our type 1 error rate of 2.5%, and we suppose that um, a treatment effect of 10 is clinically significant, and that is what we would like to have power 0.9, so 90% power of finding a positive result if, if that's the true treatment effect. Then calculations will show that in a fixed sample study, we'd need 132 subjects on each treatment. So to go from there to a group sequential design, what else do we have to specify? Well, first of all, how many analyses are we going to have? So in this example, I'm saying, let's have three analyses. So that's two interim analyses and one final analysis. And um, I'm going to have an error spending design. And the way in which I spend error will be in proportion to the square of information. So we'll talk a bit more about the choice of error spending function later on. But now let's suppose this is what we've chosen to use. And finally, my, my futility boundary is going to be non-binding. And what that means is that if we actually cross that lower boundary, but the data monitoring committee, for whatever reason, decide the study should continue, and then later on we cross the upper boundary and get a positive result, then we can claim that positive result. And we still will have controlled the type 1 error rate at 0.025, even though we didn't um, stop when we crossed the futility band. And what we can find from our software is that for this group sequential design, we need to inflate the maximum sample size over that of the fixed sample size by a factor of 1.093. So we're adding about 9%, and our target of 132 becomes a maximum of 144 patients per treatment arm. So let's see how this works in, in EAST. We're going to set up this study. We're going to look at what the fixed sample design is, and then we're going to create the group sequential design and see what happens as we enter data. So I've got East loaded, and this is the, the startup screen, and the design that I'm offered is actually what I want, so I just say OK. So this is a trial with a continuous response comparing two treatments, and um, here I've got the type 1 error 0.025, power 0.9, but I'm going to be interested in a treatment difference of 10. That's what I want my power to be, 0.9, and my standard deviation is 25. So if I click on Compute, 
and the software works out for me that a fixed sample study would need a total of 263 patients that's shared between two treatment arms. So now let's make this group sequential. So we increase the number of looks. We turn that up to three. And I'm going to use the spending function. So I'm using the row family with parameter row equals two. That will give me error spending according to information squared. And I want a futility boundary, and I'm going to have just the same spending function on the row family, row equals two, a non-binding um, lower boundary. And that's everything I need, so I can compute this. And now this, uh, this design has a maximum sample size of 208. So we've got the 144 treatment arm. We can look at it in a little bit more detail. So we have a table here showing what the efficacy boundary and the futility boundary are numerically. We can bring up a, a diagram. There's the stopping boundaries on the Z scale. So there are those critical values uh, at each point. It's also interesting to look at this on the, the scale of the, uh, the treatment effect, which here is called delta. This is my theta. Um, let's focus on the second analysis. Um, and what you see is that in order to reject H0 at the second analysis, we need a treatment effect estimate of 8.47. So if the true treatment is 10, then it's quite likely that the estimate will be at least 8.47, so there's a good chance of stopping with a positive outcome at this second analysis. On the other hand, if the treatment effect is zero, if uh, there is no improvement over control, then we'll be well below the lower boundary if we see an estimate of zero. We can also look at the plot here of the error spending function. This shows this um, spending according to the information squared. So it starts off increasing quite slowly, and then it ramps up. Um, and at the end, we're spending 0.025 as the total type 1 error, and 0.1 as the total type 2 error. OK. So I'd like to, to save this design. I'm going to give it a name. Let's call it sequential test. And um, I'm going to save it, and it goes into a workbook over here, which I can give a name. Let's call that Blestral. Um, I actually want to have another copy of this. I'm going to analyze this study in two different ways. So I'm going to just compute the same design all over again. And this time, I'm going to call this one um, GST2. And I'll save that as a second entry in my workbook. So everything is set. We've got our trial in place. Um, we can see what happens when we start getting some data. So if we go to the first trial, GST, and click on it, we get a, a summary of all the information that we've just seen. And, um, I'm going to click here on interim monitoring, and that brings up a, a screen where I can enter data and see what happens to the boundary and whether we cross it or not. So at the first analysis, let's have some interim data. Suppose everything goes to plan and we do have our 96 um, observations, which is one third of 288. But let's suppose that the estimated treatment effect at this point is 4.2. By the way, notice that the, the software has calculated the standard error. So although we've got 4.2, the standard error on that is, is over 5. So this is a pretty noisy estimate.
And when we do the calculation, we can see the boundary at the first analysis. If we bring up this graphic here, you can see where we are. Well in, well in the middle of the continuation region, we can click over here on show design and see what will be coming at future analyses. So we will carry on past this analysis. Let's do that. And let's suppose that um, at the second analysis, let's suppose the results are rather disappointing as a, as a first experiment. I'm going to put in 3.2. So the, the estimated effect has, has decreased. Um, it's only 3.2. And in this case, the study would come to an end with a negative outcome. We've crossed the lower boundary and the uh, messages stop here of utility. So it's disappointing, but at least we've managed to save a third of our potential sample size by stopping early. So let's change that. Let's put in a, a more positive outcome. I'm going to re-enter these data and let's suppose that this second analysis, we have an estimate of 8.7. So what would happen then? So it's come up quite away from the 3.2 that we saw earlier. But remember that, uh, so the 4.2 we saw earlier. But remember that was a very noisy estimate. So it's, it's quite plausible that it, the estimate changes this much. And in this case, We've actually gone all the other way, and we've crossed the upper boundary, and the study would stop at this analysis with a positive result. So again, we've saved resources, but I would think quite crucially, we've now got our positive result at a substantially earlier time, and so we can move to market um, with more patent life remaining. So let's have a final case where we put in an interim estimate of five, and see what that shows. So now we're going to be in the continuation region. So the study should, should carry on, but we're low down in the continuation region. So you might be interested to know how likely is it, given where we are now, that we'll end up with a positive result. And so we can look at this um, graphic here of conditional power. And what this shows is the probability that we will get a positive result, given where we are now, which, which of course depends on the true treatment effect. So if, it, if it's the case that the true treatment effect is 10, now the evidence is somewhat against that, but it's not out of the question because our estimate of five is still quite a noisy estimate, then that would give us a conditional power of 0.63. If, on the other hand, the true treatment effect is down around 5, then the conditional power is 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Um, that's not very promising. Well, according to this design, we're meant to continue. So let's do that. And let's put in one final piece of information. So now we're going to analysis 3. And let's suppose at the very end, our treatment estimate um, had gone up slightly to 5.9. What's this going to produce? A test statistic of 2.00 and a boundary that's a little bit higher than that. So we haven't quite managed to get a positive result. This is about the most frustrating uh, outcome you can imagine. We've gone all the way to the end, and we've fallen slightly short of a, a positive result. Um, well, we'll come back to this example when we talk about sample size re-estimation. Um, there's one more thing I'd like to do here while we're still looking at this design, and that's to talk about how you can explore its properties. And one thing you can do is use the simulation tool. You press here. And 
And this will allow us to, um, to look at random results as we run repeated replicates of the same trial. Um, so here is our, our setup. I'm just going to change one thing, make this a, a Z statistic, because I'm assuming my variance is known. And um, here I'm going to generate trial results when the true treatment effect really is 10. And I'm going to have 200,000 simulations. I've increased that number just to actually slow it down slightly so you get a chance to see what's happening in these simulations. So what we get here is a small selection of examples where we see what happens in particular instances of the trial following this, um, this pattern. And then over here, we're calculating a summary picture of how often we reject null hypothesis, how often we don't, and when that happens. OK, so those 200,000 replications are finished. And you can see here from this 90 that we rejected H0 90% of the time, which is what the power condition um, required. And on average, we had 198 subjects observed. You can change some of the settings. We could do simulations under a different treatment effect and uh, explore the results there if, if you want. So let's return to our slides. We've got a, a screenshot of some of that East session um, for you to, to refer back to. Um, and let's just discuss a little bit about what was happening here. Um, first of all, the choice of the error spending function. Um, so what I'd like to say is that it's really, that was one of the family of error spending functions, where we spend information according to a, a power of this fraction, the information observed over this maximum information that we've got as our target. And we were squaring this, but if we raise this to different powers, then you can see we get different shapes of error spending curve. So row equals one is, is just linear. Row equals two starts more slowly. Row equals three starts even more slowly still. And choosing the value of row will choose will, will change um, different properties of the design. So here are some summary properties. Um, in the case of row equals two, that was what we we're just using. Um, as we increase the number of analyses, we have to change the inflation factor. This goes up a little each time. So the maximum sample size is getting a bit bigger. But with just two analyses, you can see that instead of 100% of the fixed sample size, we, we're, we're getting an average of 70%, 89%, 80%. And as we add more analyses, we can push these numbers down. So we're getting bigger savings in expected sample size. This second row is, is the example we've just seen in this cholesterol study. So these are the properties of that design, and these would be what you saw if you ran simulations into these different settings. So what if we choose a different value of row? Well, I can set row equals three instead. And so here I spend my error more slowly to begin with. The inflation factor is a, a little smaller, so we're a bit more cautious. We have a, a smaller increase in the maximum sample size. And if you compare the tables, if you go backwards and forwards, you'd see these expected sample sizes have not gone down quite as much as for row equal two, but they're, they're, they're fairly, fairly similar. Um, and we've got the same feature that we can add more analyses and the, the returns are somewhat diminishing. So I would say two, three, possibly four analyses will be as many as most people want to go to. Um, and depending on your appetite for increasing the maximum sample size, row equals two, row equals three will give you a suitable design. Now, why this particular family? There are other choices available. Well, we know that this family gives designs which are very efficient. There's a, the paper down here um, goes into that in detail and shows that um, it's pretty hard to beat these designs in terms of getting a lower average sample size under various treatment effects. Um, 
There is another family, the gamma family. It's a little bit more complicated to describe, and that's also efficient in a fairly similar way. Um, so working within those uh, families will give you good, good designs. And then, as you've seen, tables which show the properties of the design as you vary the number of analyses or the, the maximum sample size can help you choose the design that you want to use. OK, so that brings us through the topic of group sequential designs. Um, I'd like to move on to talk about sample size re-estimation. And really, it's, it's not a huge jump. Um, my, my way of describing this is maybe a rather personal view, is to say we're trying to do very much the same things, and in the end, we do it in a very similar way. We'd like to be able to reduce sample size below um, other options that have the same size and power. We'd like to reach our conclusions earlier. And what happens in a group sequential test is we set up this large maximum sample size that we need to ensure power, but we hope to stop early. And what we've seen in these examples is it's very likely that the data will, will help us to stop early before that final analysis. The philosophy that I think underlines the idea of sample size re-estimation is we, we, we turn things the other way around and say, we're going to start with a small study, but sometimes we'll ask for more. Of course, the end result is the same. In both cases, you get a range of possible sample sizes from small to large. But in the sample size re-estimation, it's done by setting an initial sample size, conducting an interim analysis, and then thinking about whether one should increase the sample size. Having done that, we can analyze the final set of data and make a conclusion. So one, one can talk about a, a planned end, well, in the sense that it's a kind of provisional plan, because we might go for more. All of these designs have to be pre-specified. So it's, it's not that we have a, a brilliant idea to increase the sample size only after seeing their interim data. Um, this will all be pre-specified. Um, and then what happens at an interim analysis, we can stop. We can stop early in favor of the new treatment or, or stop the futility. We can have regions where we keep this original planned sample size, and we can have a region where we push ahead and, and increase the sample size. How do we do that? How can we do that and um, protect type 1 error? Well, in the case of a two-stage design, this is the easiest one to describe. Um, we can use what's called a, a combination test, and this goes back to Bauer and Kerner in the 1994 paper. And the notation here, it's important to understand what these Zs are. Z1, where 1 is in brackets, is our Z statistic based on the stage 1 data. And Z2 is the Z statistic based on the new data in stage 2. So only the new data. It's not cumulative. It's just looking at the extra information in stage 2. And we combine these by simply taking a weighted combination, which is set up so that this overall Z will have a standard normal distribution if the treatment effect is 0. And therefore, we can reject the null hypothesis if we see exceed the usual 1.96 for a 2.5% test. But the way in which this is done is, has a very nice property that everything holds, even if we redesign stage 2 after seeing stage 1 data. So if the results are in a certain place, we might increase the stage 2 sample size. And by calculating this combination test defined in this particular way, we can still do this test at the end and get our 2.5% error probability. And there's a multi-stage version of this. Um, the Sui Hung and Wang paper describes this, and Leimacher and Wasma described essentially the same design, um, even though the way these two are presented, they don't necessarily look at to be the same at first sight. And what's happening here is that, again, we've got these stage-wise Z statistics, each one based on the new data arriving in a particular stage. 
And we start off with the group sequential design with K stages. And then the trick here is that if we make an adaptation and after a certain analysis, maybe we increase all the group sizes, we replace the Zs that were going to be here by new versions of Z, Z twiddles, say, based on the new data with the larger group sizes. But if theta is zero, they're still all normal zero one, and we can put them together and use the original testing boundary, and we still get a test with the right type one error. So it may take a little more time to, to consider that to see just why it works, but this is what underlies the approach. We can go straight to an implementation of this approach in our, in our example of the cholesterol study. Imagine that we've gone through the process as seen before, and we've got to this point of analysis two, where we're continuing and things are not looking particularly promising. And so the question is, can we improve power now by increasing that group size in stage three? So here we are at the second analysis, rather low down in the continuation region. And the idea of increasing the sample size will mean that our, our, our third stage Z statistic, it would still have mean zero if the treatment effect was zero. But if there's a positive treatment effect, we'd boost the mean because it's based on a bigger sample size. So let's um, try that out in East. Go to this carbon copy of my design. And um, I want to monitor it now using Sui Hung and Wang. So here we are. And we start off just as before. I'm going to put in the same information. So what did we have at the first analysis? We had 4.2. Um, based on 96 subjects. So everything is as it was before. But the second analysis, What we put in is slightly different because we're only putting in the information about the second group of, of subjects. So I've still got, I've got 96 as their sample size, that's right. And I'm going to put in 5.8. As I'm saying, the mean in the group two is 5.8. And that means the overall mean, if we combine group one two, is 5.0 for the, um, the treatment effect. And then this tells me that the incremental statistic, so that's my Z with a Subscript two in, in brackets is 1.137. And when we combine it with stage one, we get this weighted statistic, 1.386. So that takes us to this scenario that we saw before, because um, basically we've done just the same. But now, let's suppose we decide to increase the size of the third group. So when I enter my stage three data, I'm going to add 50%. So I'll make this into 144 rather than 96. Let's suppose that from this group, we get an estimated treatment effect of seven. So still somewhere below 10. One thing we have to do here is change the standard error because this is based on a different sample size. So we actually put in a formula and we end up dividing by 74, which is, sorry, by 72, which is half of 144. And um, that's what we need to feed into the um, Sui Hung Wang design. So there we go. And when we look and see what that produced, um, our final weighted test statistic is 2.101. We've managed to cross the efficacy boundary. Okay. So in this particular case, 
And of course, this is just an illustrative example. The sample size increase has, has worked out. We're, we've ended up on the right side now. We're on the positive side of the efficacy boundary. We've got a positive result. OK, so that was our EAST demonstration showing you can, you can run a, a Sui Hung Wang design using essentially the same setup and then just entering your data in a slightly different way um, as you vary the group sizes. OK, so let's go back to our PowerPoint. We have a snapshot. So that's just showing some of the um, output from the East session that we've seen. And let's have a, a short discussion. I think um, in the interest of time, I should be very brief here. Um, my comments really uh, are to say, when Sui Hung and Wang introduced their method, it was actually to solve a problem. They were all working at the FDA, and they were used to people coming to the mid-trial and saying, we designed this trial, we're looking at our interim data, and it looks like we overestimated the treatment effect. So really, our study wasn't powered enough. We'd like to increase the sample size. What do we do? And what they had to say was, well, you can't do anything. It's too late. Um, but that led them to propose a way of dealing with that problem. But over time, I mean, that was 20 years ago, uh, as adaptive designs have become accepted, the regulators have issued guidances, and they require designs to be pre-specified. So the idea of coming midway in your design and saying, actually, we'd like to change things is still not really an option. And of course, if you've done all of this up front, you've pre-specified everything, you can look at the design as a whole, look at it holistically, and you can ask, how good a design is it, looking at its overall property? Um, so I would say, if you are using this approach, you should look at any proposal for a sample size re-estimation design and ask, how well does it do? And in particular, have you chosen a good rule for, you, for your adjustment of the sample size? There are some good ways of doing that, and there are some not so good ways. So if you look at the design that you've created, you find out what's its power curve, where does it achieve power 0.9 overall when you take the design as a whole. Compare then a group sequential design that has the same features, the same maximum sample size, the same number of groups, uh, so number of analyses, um, and ask, does it actually do better? If it does, maybe that's what you should be using. But if your sample size re-estimation design is just about as efficient as a group sequential design, and I would say, of course, a good one, so go to the row family to get a good design to compare with. Um, if you're doing as well as that, then your sample size re-estimation design is, is fine. Um, another question that may come up is, well, is it possible to stage investment in a different way with sample size re-estimation? Do you, um, you get to decide? whether you need your last tranche of funding in a different way. But I think, actually, the scenario is very similar. Whether you increase the last stage sample size or whether you run the last group of a group sequential design is really a very, very parallel sort of choice. Um, one area that I'm, uh, I really have only time to mention very briefly, though, um, is in dealing with pipeline data, um, an issue that can happen very commonly in a sequential group sequential design is that you can stop the trial at an interim analysis, and then you get a bit more data on patients who were treated but hadn't yet provided their responses, or even just observations that are new events in a survival study that have happened after the data lock for the interim analysis, but before the conclusion. And then the question is, what do you do with those data? And um, are you in the embarrassing position that they actually change uh, the conclusion that you thought you had. And in sample size re-estimation, one gets a very nice framework where you can say if you have a large pipeline of patients, the decision really is, do we just keep that pipeline number of patients or do we increase it? And in the, the first example in the Mater and Pocock 2010 paper, we see exactly that. 
there's a, an initial target sample size of 442. At the interim analysis, nearly all those patients are enrolled, but only half of them have been observed. The others are in the pipeline. So the question is, do we just wait for the pipeline patients to come through, provide their responses, which happen at 26 weeks, with an extra 26 um, additional patients, or do we increase the sample size uh, globally to some higher level? And the, the sample size re-estimation framework uh, provides a very natural way of doing that. It's got a lot in common with the Hampton and Jenison approach, I would say, but it, I think this one is, is, is pretty nice to, to understand. Uh, what else would I like to say? Um, well, going back to this 2010 paper, um, where Bita and Pocock dis described the promising zone design. Um, so Bruce Turnbull and I read that and we thought we'd like to comment on it. And um, we really focused on the, the sample size rule. And we said, one can be more systematic in how you define it. If you use a more decision theoretic approach, looking at the benefit of increased power against the cost of um, additional patients, we can actually make a version of this method which is more efficient, uh, efficient in the sense of achieving the same power with a lower sample size. And what's been very nice to see is in the following paper by Charlie and Meta, uh, I think we've converged because there these authors say, well, yes, they, they like our approach. They still want to tweak it a bit. They've got a requirement of a, a certain minimum conditional power sample size to increase. Um, but there's the same underlying principle that when you do increase the sample size, it should be in this decision theoretic framework. OK, well, I think that really brings us to the end. There are some notes here on factors to think about, but maybe we should move on to questions. Um, here are the summaries. Group sequential designs, they can save you a lot, 30% of your sample size compared to a fixed sample test. You can get similar. Um, designs under a sample size re-estimation approach. And I'd say that's particularly attractive when you've got a large amount of pipeline data. Um, we have specific designs to recommend and there's current software to implement them. Okay, so let me hand back um, to our host and we'll go to the question, uh, question and answer stage. Thank you, Chris. Before we move into the Q&A, um, we want to take a moment to remind you that EAST gives you easy access to a wide selection of trusted fixed and adaptive trial designs. EAST is used by nearly every major pharmaceutical company and the FDA with a broad selection of popular designs in an easy to use format. We can help you quickly create and compare trial designs. Our company also offers a range of services from staff that act as an extension of your team and consulting services for more cutting edge projects to our new real world analytics capabilities. We're here to help support your objectives. So now we're going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. So Chris, our first question here. Uh, for interim analysis, where our endpoint is, for example, change in cholesterol at month six, what is your recommendation on handling patients who are enrolled in the study but have not yet reached the primary endpoint? Do you suggest excluding them from the interim analysis or including them with imputed values? Oh, okay. Um, it depends what you've got. Um, if, you, if you have some way of imputing, suppose you've measured cholesterol at, uh, at two weeks, um, that might allow you to to predict something for that patient at, at six weeks. Um, if not, if you if really you just measure the baseline and then you're, you're uh, sorry, four weeks, wasn't it? Uh, if you just measure baseline and four weeks um, and you've got nothing in between, then I think you're in the, the scenario I was describing with, with a pipeline. Uh, in fact, Lisa Hampson and I use that example uh, in our paper to illustrate our proposals. Um, in the setting that we have, it's quite a small pipeline. So it's a, I don't know, I forget, 10 or 20% of the total sample size maybe in the pipeline at any point. Whereas in that um, Meta Pocock example, it's, it's more like 50%. Um, 
But Lisa and I do go on to say, if you have a nice longitudinal model and you can take a, a short-term measurement, which is a good predictor of a long-term measurement, then um, you can almost get back to, you know, closer to the kind of immediate response situation. Um, and your benefits of doing things group sequentially uh, would increase. Thank you. And, and another question here. Do you have any recommendations on how to derive information fractions for longitudinal data? So information fractions. So what we saw in the in the formula was the, the information fraction is the information at the current analysis divided by something I called I max. And I think when you read the papers in this area, you can get quite confused about what this IMAX ought to be. Is it the information you'll have at the end if you go all the way to the end? Uh, so it's an estimate uh, at, at that time, or, or is it a target that you fix? So what Bruce and I recommend in our book is that you think of the IMAX as a target information. So it's actually fixed. It's not something you're trying to estimate. Um, how you would set that target with longitudinal data, um, that might be a challenge. You'd have to know quite a bit about the correlation structure over time to work out um, just what that number should be, uh, given your patient numbers. But once you've got IMAX, then the information fraction is simple. You have IK, which is reciprocal of variance of your current estimate that you get from fitting the model. And then the fraction is IK over IMAX. End of story. So our last question here, can you combine group sequential and sample size re-estimation? Well, yes, I think the, the approach is, is basically doing that. It, it starts with a group sequential design and then allows you to change the later group sizes. Um, so the setting is, and, and that's really what I was, if you think about it, that's what was happening in that second visit to the example. We had a group sequential design with three analyses, and at analysis two, we, um, we chose to increase the third group. I mean, I think there are some provisos. Um, there are provisos in that you have to say that you're going to do things like that up front. Um, so there was less error spending going on in that Sui Hung Wang design. If, if my first and second group sizes had, had varied from the target, um, it would have been a bit awkward. Um, except what we'd said was we're going to calculate these stage-wise Z values and combine them with, with predetermined weights. Uh, and that gets around that problem. Um, so yes, I'd say you can make that combination it does require some care to, to be able to do it properly. But I think that I would say the the way it was handled in the example I showed you that was working through the East implementation is fine. Thank you, Chris. And, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar on modern uses of group sequential designs and sample size re-estimation. On behalf of Cytel, uh, thank you for joining us today and, and I hope that you have a great rest of your day.